All right, Josh Smith here at my studio again, live from Flat Five. And my guest today is one of my favorite guitar players and a good friend. Um, I really think he's one of the most important new voices, honestly, in like commercial, not commercial, in contemporary music and jazz. He's one of my favorite improvisers. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to have linked up with him and become buddies and been able to hang some. You may have seen him as star of Netflix with Ben Platt. I remember seeing that come up on my, my Netflix account. And I was like, oh, there's my friend, you know. Or maybe you've seen him with Bob Reynolds or back in the day with Esperanza Spaulding or uh, different people. He's, uh, he plays with a lot of people. He lives in New York. But he's just an incredible guitar player and a good friend. And, uh, Nira, thank you for coming. Oh, and he has a new record, which is ruling, but we'll get into that. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. I love your playing. Um, I, I've been a fan for a long that. time. And what's fascinating to me when we, when we became friends and started to talk is even though we have divergent paths, we have very similar beginnings. And I find that with a lot of guys around our age, you know, that we, we have the same kind of lightning bolt moments, the same influences, and, and these things that kind of spur us along. So I'm curious... Who put the guitar in your hands the first time, and how did it become even a thing that you you could fall in love with? Where where did it come from initially? Dude, it's it's such a dorky answer, but it it really speaks to the importance of like just having a little bit of music in schools. You know, that's always the first funding that gets cut. But I probably wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for this. We had a keyboards class in middle school i was probably like 12 years old almost 13 and um it was like as as dinky as it gets just like a couple little broken down keyboards and like you play little songs with one finger you know and like try to sound them out and then one day the teacher's like hey um i have a friend who's going to come by and play some guitar for you guys and this was a berkeley kid who you know had been a student of this guy's when he was younger and they kept in touch and I guess he was home for this break or something, wanted to pick up some students. And he said, hey, can I come play guitar for your kids? And maybe some kids will want some lessons. And that was me. I was that kid. I, I saw him play guitar and I was like, that, I want to do that. Wow. It was just like, as soon as he just, you know, he picked it up, he probably played something that was rocking or bluesy or whatever. And, and I was like, you know, enthralled. So, um, you know, I hooked up with him, and then when he came home next time for the summer or whatever, I started taking my first lessons, age 13. Wow. So did you, did you have to convince your parents to get you a guitar, or were they on board right away? <laughs> I think they had wanted me to, like, you know, fall into something like that. They were just kind of waiting for the thing, because, like, they didn't really push me into any sort of, you know, they, I think they tried to, like, you know, get me into sports and stuff, and I wasn't still still i'm not like all that athletic you know i liked it but it wasn't like my passion i wasn't like yeah i want to play i want to play basketball again i was like yeah this is cool um and then when i first started getting those lessons it was like the lightning bolt you know i was like this is this is just it this is it for me and do you remember loving music before the guitar or was it concurrent because a lot of people i talk to can't remember like the music they liked as a child uh, they maybe remember what their parents liked. Were there any things that you fell in love with musically before the guitar came around? Totally, Ben. I loved music. I was like baby, basically babysat by MTV. You know, my parents both worked and I would come home and straight away I would turn on the TV and that's who I would hang out with till my parents got home from work. It was just watching music videos. That was, it was a different time then. And they just showed nothing but music all day long. And I was just into all the bands, you know, I was into the metal bands, I was into the rock bands, I was into the alternative bands, I was into pop music, I was into hip hop, I was into whatever they played on MTV, I couldn't get enough of, and then I would go listen to the radio after that. Wow, okay. So what was the first music that kind of turned you out then? What, what, what got you excited the most? Like what's, what style, do you remember a specific artist that really, you know, nailed you first, I guess? Before I started playing? Yeah. Metallica. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's somewhere deep in the DNA. You know, I became a jazz guitarist later, but like when I was a kid, there well, Guns N' Roses and Metallica. And I mean, I was really, I was young. So like, to give you a funny example of how young I was, um, I got Use Your Illusion 1 and Use Your Illusion 2 on cassette. 
Me too. Being a kid. Me too. Yeah. Cassette, right? Mm -hmm. Being a kid and not really understanding how it worked. Like, how does a cassette, like, how, I didn't know, I didn't know how to listen to, there was an album with the title one and an album with the title two. Use Your Illusion one and two. Being a kid, I thought you had to listen to Use Your Illusion one in its entirety before you could even put on Use Your Illusion two. Yeah. I thought it was like a movie. You know, I didn't want to start in the middle. So I would like, fall asleep like one song into use your illusion too i don't think i ever listened to the whole album <laughs> dude that brings back a lot of memories because that was the way i fell asleep every day i would beg to go to the store to buy tapes and then of course i you know got suckered into the columbia music house tape <laughs> you know collection okay, nice. and had the tape start showing up but that was it i'd put a tape on and if i was lucky i would stay awake to have time to flip the tape Otherwise, you know, it would just stop. I'd be already asleep by the time it hit the end of the first side, you know. Yeah. yeah. Man, it's crazy to think about, like, you know, we've devoted our lives to music, but, you know, in some way, I know for me, like, as a kid, music kind of took care of me, even before I played an instrument. Oh, yeah. You know, it was central to my life. It was, like, the thing that I had that I could really latch on to and connect with. Yep. I mean, I started playing guitar at six years old. And I was hearing music every day, so I was I was in it like really quick and early and, and obsessed. But you know, when it came time, yeah, to go to bed every night, it was like I had a little ritual of like picking out which tape I was gonna listen to, you know. And then the big thing was when I turned 13 for my bar mitzvah, I wanted a stereo. Everybody then had the tower with the the wood cabinet and the glass door you know, the old school stereo with two big speakers. So I wanted the Sony stereo. So I got that for my bar mitzvah. So then I had a CD player finally. And it was like, yeah, just a watershed moment of it would keep playing when I went to bed. It would switch to the next disc. It would, you know, it was like, that was the best. That was the best. Yeah. That's badass, man. <laughs> That's All a right, great so, so you're way to use that bar mitzvah. taking lessons from this dude that came to your middle school. Who was, you said he was a Berkeley yeah. kid, so he probably knew music. He was maybe a good teacher. When does it transition into, like, you start to feel like you you got something here and maybe you need to get with other musicians and start start playing actual music with people? Well, it's funny, man, because, you know, don't trust a Berkeley kid. No, I'm just kidding. I went to Berkeley myself. This dude, my parents would pay in, like, installments of three lessons, right? Right. So we got to a point where, like, I think he, we paid for the next three lessons and he gave me one lesson and then never came back. <laughs> he just disappeared. Yeah. We couldn't find him. We wouldn't return our calls. Well, there's still, so teachers that was, are still like, musicians at heart, right? You can't trust any of them. <laughs> that's when I needed a new teacher, when my teacher disappeared with our money. Um, no, he was a good guy. We were probably, you know, I think he would charge like 30 bucks a lesson. Like, you know, he was a kid. Um, and, um, and I found this great teacher after that, this guy named Frank DeBretti, who is still active. I think he lives in Houston now, but he was a Nashville guy after his stint in uh, teaching kids in Westchester. He moved to Nashville and, you know, he played on, you know, did sessions and tours and stuff. And um, he's now in Houston and still does. But he was an amazing teacher, uh, especially for a kid. He like really pushed me and challenged me. Like he'd be like, what, what do you want to learn? I'd say, well, I got this Django Reinhardt CD and like this I Got Rhythm solo, you know, sounds amazing. And he's like, okay, cool. I'll transcribe it for you. You know, and he would. He'd show up next week with the, it, it written out in tablature for me. You know, wow. he was like awesome. He was just an awesome guy and an awesome teacher and really devoted to his students. And um, he just pushed me, man. He's like, here, learn it. You asked for it. So. Wow. How'd you get that Django yeah. Reinhardt CD anyways? What even made you interested? guitar magazines okay that's all i had man like i had i had frank for a while and then frank moved to nashville so we lost him as the local teacher and then all i had was the magazines mm -hmm. you know i would like find stores that had back issues of guitar player and i would get them and learn out of the back and it was years of that like yeah. just really piecing together what i could from those lessons we didn't have like the internet and all the plethora of oh, stuff okay. that people have which was good and bad because you know you got to figure out your own thing like i would hear about a new guitar player i wouldn't be able to search for them online i would just have to imagine what they sounded like yep. you know yeah. you remember I, that i remember 
vividly, like going through Guitar for the Practicing Musician or Guitar Player or Guitar World and reading about a player and thinking, I know I would really like this guy, but I have no idea what he sounds like. But I just know yeah. I will like this guy, either by the way he looks yeah. or what he says or what guitar he's holding. I just knew I would like him. And it, it could be a year before I ended up actually hearing him play. But I was usually right. I usually liked it, you know? Yeah. Nice. It was weird. Yeah, I remember that time. I remember the frustration of it, like, you know, with whatever tiny budget I had, like I could go to the CD store and get one thing. And like being curious about music, I wanted to get a thousand things, but at that time you just couldn't hear it all. Um, and it did, I think, have some sort of, you know, if there was one good thing about it is that like you had to kind of create your own thing out of more or less nothing. Okay. You know, you had you had what you had and everything else was like up to you to, to you know, to, to bring out of yourself. Yeah. And people underestimate the importance of that that era of the guitar magazine it was huge on people from our generation because like you said it was the only way to read about these guys it had lessons every month and guitar was booming i mean you had stevie ray and eddie van halen basically make make guitar just explode from 1980 on and then you know it went into just shred fest just guitar everywhere these there were so many magazines and so many things to read and it wasn't just the stories it was like the ads you know and looking at you know every magazine there'd be seven ads with eddie in it you know what i mean or seven steve i ads and each one was like some weird picture with crazy shit everywhere you know but i i, I would rip them out and put them on the walls like it was it, guitar was was everything yeah we devoured those we read every word on every page everyone every word yeah uh, all right so before, so what happens then when do you start playing with other musicians when does like when's the first gig actually okay so um it's like kind of a twisted road like they all are right like yeah, it does course. it's not a straight path but you know i would i would go to these guitar workshops for a week or so over the summer huh. and i was lucky enough to meet a guy i met a few people that first summer i did it. i was probably 15 or 16 you know and i met um uh, uh, that first summer I met a guy named Ryan Scott, who's still active in the New York scene, who's burning, one of my favorite guitar players of all time, um, still making amazing music, you should check him out. Yeah. Um, and there was another guy named Seth Feinberg at the time who had a band. He was like working already. He could really play and uh, he was working, like real gigs, um, opening act for all sorts of people, festivals and stuff. And um, we hooked up that first summer and he said, you know, why don't you come be my, my rhythm guitar player? You know, your mom could drop you off at my dad's house and we'll have band practice. And I hired a professional drummer from New York City. And like, it was definitely like uh, the closest I'd ever been to anything legitimate. And so my first gig was at, um, shoot, I forget the name of the club, but we opened up for Merle Saunders. My second gig, we opened up for O'Teal, you wow. know? The third gig was like the Bayou Blues and Music Festival. So like, I kind of jumped in the deep end, or at least what what seemed like the deep end for a 16 year old kid. Mm -hmm. And we play clubs in the city and all that. But that's kind of all I had was just that playing his music, being the rhythm guitar guy, which was, I get a solo every night, but it wasn't like, um, it wasn't necessarily the most fulfilling thing, but it was a gig and it was cool. Right. Um, and then, I went to, to music school. That's when I really started playing with other people that could play circles around me, and um, and they sure did. And I just kind of had to deal. I had to catch up. Yeah. And how old was that dude that you started playing with those first gigs? He was he older than you? I think we were the same age. He might have been a year younger. Yeah, he's okay. still doing it too. He's like he's a singer songwriter now. He's making cool music down I think in Atlanta. Um, so it's, it was kind of cool to see like you know. A lot of the people that I met doing these camps as a kid, they're still out there doing it. Yeah. yeah. It's an amazing thing, you know, when you start at a young age, you know, like anything, you fall in love with this. And you said athlete earlier, you know, we all, I love sports. So I wanted to be, you know, as a kid, I was delusional. I was going to be the first person ever to be in the baseball hall of fame and the rock and roll hall of fame at the same time, you know, and, you know, Dude, talk, I think you can do it. talk about delusions. But, you know, eventually <laughs> my, my baseball comeback is starting soon. But, you know, yeah. we all reach this point of, oh, you know what? I'm never going to be a major league baseball player. 
music never gets taken away from you. You know, whether you do it for a career or not, it's something you can do forever, and you do it because you love it. And it's amazing how that, that become when, when you do make that your life and your music, guys do that for forever. I can't count the number of friends and younger musicians that I grew up around who still have never had a day job, and this is all they've done, you know? Yeah. 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 Dude, and, you know, I just, I just remembered another, another um, guy that was in camp with us that I, I bet you know is Nate Tello. Yeah. We're all hanging out at age 16. You, you got to check out Ryan. Ryan's such a burning player. But, like, I that was a little crew back then. Little oh, blue, cool. blues kids. Oh, blues kids. Yep. All right. So tell, tell me the Stevie. How did Stevie hit you, man? What was the first time you heard him? I got Texas Flood at, at the record store. I've been hearing about this guy. I got Texas Flood. And that was it forever, you know, for the rest of my life. You yeah. know, I'd had other heroes before. You know, I'd heard Hendrix and I loved Hendrix and I'd, you know, heard Jimmy Page. I loved Jimmy Page. Clapton was the first guy who I wanted to have all his records. I wanted to learn all his songs. I had like a book of Eric Clapton, you know, tabs or whatever. I would try to learn every note. But when I heard Stevie, it was like, uh oh, that's everything. Like I just anything that came anything else wasn't interesting anymore. It was like that was it. And how long passed between hearing him and seeing him play like on a video or something oh that's a good question i have no idea i'd never like i never i saw some probably austin city limits stuff like maybe they, they showed something on on tv once you know and i caught like a bit of it and i was like you know but it's not like i i didn't have friends that that really played or had the videos i didn't know where i could buy them you know so yeah it was a while i think before i, I got to see it on video because that was i mean i loved the music but that was what what got me was like someone gave me live at the elma combo before it was an official release it was just a bootleg and so i was wow. 10 when stevie died so i had heard you know crossfire i heard family style but i didn't have any records you know i had just heard on the radio probably heard pride and joy on the radio and i liked it because i loved albert king already i loved bb king i loved hendrix um, but I hadn't seen Stevie yet or owned a record, and I don't think my dad had any Stevie records either. So when someone gave me this video, I put it in, and, and it was like seeing him sweat like that and go, you know, all in, that was life-changing because it was like, man, I, I just want to do that. That's what I want to do for the rest of my life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think I saw the video right away, but I probably, like, around the same time like maybe it was transcribed in a magazine right like the yeah. texas flood solo or something you know so i just i just dove in and i just wanted to sound like him and i wanted wanted to know what he like i'm still using you know 13 gauge strings because i put them on my guitar because i wanted to be like stevie you know yeah. uh you and me both bro you and me both <laughs> yeah. yeah you know and my career is taking these other twists and turns but like it kind of all goes back to that into like the you know i'm sure we'll get into the geek stuff later but like just like when you hit a note it not just being you know when a lot of jazz people play jazz guitars play they just play the note that they're playing and that's it but i still have a bit of like there's always this muted thing it's not that all the time but there's always that yeah. dude that's it, stevie it is so so much a part of our generation guys our age because we were just ready for this this lightning rod just like you know guys before us were ready for clapton you know or, or hendrix you know and, and, and it is it's guys our age it's eddie van halen and stevie ray vaughn i mean those are the two lightning rods and like it was funny i was interviewing greg cock yesterday and he said he had heard let's dance on the radio and he thought you know what is what's up with this albert king thing and then he saw an interview in a magazine where David Bowie says, no, it's this young guy that I saw in, in Montro, Stevie Ray. And Greg said he'd never seen Vaughn spelled like that, so he thought it was Stevie Ray Vaughan. <laughs> and he said he went to the record store asking him if they had any records by Stevie Ray Vaughan, and they sold him Texas Flood. <laughs> nice. Yeah. They did have some Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Turns out. But, dude, so many so guys you... who have grown 
and become jazz guys and singer songwriters and funk guys and they all got that that initial spark from stevie guys around our age and that's amazing to me yeah i guess like if i had to you know because i don't i was going to ask you like how hard eddie hit you because eddie for me was like it did it, did, it didn't connect the same way it did with some other people i, I respect it and love it so much but it's just it wasn't a lightning rod for me well eddie for me you know, so Eddie, the first record came out in 79. Well, that's the year I was born. You know what I mean? So it, it's weird. Stevie's first record's only four years later, 83. Right. And I started playing, I guess, in 85 when I was six years old. But a lot of it was driven by what my dad listened to. He wasn't a musician, but he listened to blues, rock, jazz, soul, you know. So we didn't have Van Halen records in my house. So the first time I heard Van Halen was probably like you, on MTV, you know, so I was probably seeing Jump as the first Van Halen thing I ever heard. And not that Jump yeah. isn't ruling, but it's not running with the devil. You know what I mean? So it was like I didn't hear that initially, but Eddie hit me for sure. But I was already so far kind of ingrained in like the blues and jazz. That was what I liked that it didn't hit me. It wasn't the same. You know what I mean? It didn't grab me the same. I only started playing in 96, so it was like, you know, the, the 80s were over. You know, the 80s were fully fully gone by the time I started playing. I remembered it from, like, you know, my Guns N' Roses, Metallica, like yeah. MTV days. But yeah. but the guitar playing didn't have – when I was a kid, like, I loved the music, but the guitar playing wasn't what I was drawn to necessarily, you know. Um, but what's interesting about those two guys, how revolutionary they, they were, like, Eddie was the guy that started just – First of all, playing the guitar like this, mm -hmm. like there was no, it wasn't positional. It was like, you know, he's like here and then he's here. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. he's the string of the whole thing, you know, and then also just seeing the guitar as a piece of wood that he could do whatever he wanted with, like oh, all yeah. sorts of, yeah. you know, kind of ripping it apart on stage. Like he had this kind of zoomed out view of it. Oh, yeah. And Stevie Ray oh. had this thing where it was like, you know, it was like a drum, you know, the, the percussiveness of it was like, it was just, other than the fact that it was just pure fire and it was just flowing through him, just yeah. this whole thing yeah. was like something that no one had ever done that I've heard. You know, and you'd go back and you see like videos of people tapping before Eddie. It was like it existed, but no one, no one really conceived of the guitar like he did. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing about Eddie is he he truly created something out of thin air. You know what I mean? And I don't yeah. think anybody i mean yeah clapton was a watershed you know the beatles and clapton obviously but i don't think just as far as impact on guitar in general to me the two guys in the whoever have had the most impact are hendrix and eddie van halen i think just in terms of driving people to actually just go pick up a guitar for no reason i don't, I don't know i don't know mm -hmm. if anybody's had the impact that those two guys have and then changed the way everybody ever played in the moments after they existed more than those two guys. I, I I don't know. That's just my opinion, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's a strong argument for that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Hendrix. It's like, you know, there's before Hendrix and there's after. There's just no way around it. I mean, he changed the entire game, and I think Eddie kind of did the same thing, you know, as far as changed the way people think about the instrument. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So so then you're gigging. Uh, you're playing, you know, singer songwriter, you're playing blues. When does jazz really, really enter the equation? Well, before I went to Berkeley, before I went to music school, you know, I, I was curious, I wanted to know about jazz and I would buy the records and, you know, anything someone could turn me on to, I would try to learn about it. Um, but I wasn't there yet. You know, I didn't really understand it from like an intuitive, you know, heartfelt, I wasn't in it yet, you know, it was just something that I listened to and checked out and tried to understand or start to get to know, you know, through my ears. But I got to Berkeley and, you know, I guess I had some sort of facility with it already. I mean, I didn't, but I guess the, the people there thought I did and they kind of just threw me in the deep end again, which is the best way to learn. They put me in all these high level jazz ensembles and I didn't know a single tune. You know, I really was not at, at the level of the other players but i was willing to work hard to get there so i caught up i think you know um i was interested in other stuff i was still interested in, in you know funk and blues and rock and hip-hop 
and um, then all of a sudden, you know, it was jazz, and uh, and I caught up and I fell in love with it, you know, in real time, you know, at school trying to be. It was just really being around people that really loved it and knew it that that made the difference. It was, it's not something you can learn out of a book, really. You just have to do it with the people that that already know how and, and love it and treasure it and take good care of it. Jazz is such like a to me a communal thing where it's very important how it first gets explained to you or just ha how the person who first kind of hips you to certain things, what his attitude is even is important. So the first guys I talked to about jazz when I was in my little blues world as a kid were super fucking snobby, you know, and, you know, didn't, didn't want to talk blues at all and couldn't respect the fact that this 12 year old kid didn't know any jazz instead it was like they were looking down at me you know like dude you got to learn some real shit and blah 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 so it turned me off right away like fuck this jazz shit you know like and then the next guys then they were really welcoming and they were like well dude you're already playing this in your blues check this out let me show you and then it was like wow okay i get it i get it i do really like this and i think that's important because jazz is such a it's it's like a mixture of all this heart and soul, but it also is very cerebral. And I think the way you take it in a lot of times shapes guys who just automatically go, I don't like that stuff, or they, they get it, you know? Yeah, I don't think it's supposed to be cerebral at its best. I mean, like anything, you know, there's like, it took you, took you, it took your brain some effort to learn it. Same with anything that you've ever learned how to do, even if it was subconscious, but I think that that attitude doesn't serve anyone. That the, what you described, I and mean, we all know a little bit of it. But you know, those guys probably weren't good players. Looking back, oh no, I think it, they weren't. They weren't. But we all yeah, know they, those guys. They didn't understand it. Yeah, yeah, they didn't. They didn't understand it themselves. You know, if if they did, they would have probably wanted you to you know know about it because they loved it. Yeah. Um, you know, if you loved something. Why would you ever like try to? I don't know. They, they didn't understand it themselves. Is my guess. So so when you get into the, to class in these jazz ensembles. So are you telling you you were never a real book guy? You weren't sitting at home playing standards ever. I wasn't there yet. Like I think I had the real book, and like I might have done some of those, you know, like high school gigs where you open the real book to Blue Bossa, and like you oh. and your buddies try to try and play it at a gig. And I'm sure it sounds horrible, but like right. you just, you know, you you uh, you bluster your way through it. Um, but no, I got to I got to school, and there were people that could really they could really play, like you know. Um, so I had to just catch up and I was in the practice room just day and night and listening to records and, you know, cause I was like, I didn't want to be left behind, you know, I, that's, you know, that's such a motivator. Number one, you'd already made the commitment. You're at a school for music. So you're, you're committed anyways, but how, yeah. I mean that, that factor of being in a room with guys that are just way better than you and not wanting to fall flat on your face. There is no better motivator. It's uh, nothing compares to that feeling. No, because you love you're there because you love music, you know, you're not you're not there for any other reason. So you're you're just you're stoked to be around great musicians. And it's great to get your butt kicked. And like, it's the best. I don't know. It's my whole, Yeah. You know, and I still I still seek it out and try to, you know, that's why I hang out with you. You know, <laughs> well, likewise, bro. Likewise, man. <laughs> oh, man. It's, yeah, I mean, we need it. We need it. As, as a kid, there would be. Uh, uh, you know, a common factors like if, if I would get on a gig and some changes would arise in a song that I didn't know how to play through or if my time was whack and I was playing rhythm guitar in this way and, and I would get a dirty look from the 50 year old man I was playing with, you could be damn sure that I would come back to that gig the next week and not make those mistakes. Nothing motivated me like trying to live up to playing with these guys who are career musicians and, and wanting to be accepted. And yeah, I mean, there's, for me, there was no greater motivator than that. Yeah. And it's interesting as we get older and like things change and you're not the young guy anymore. Like how do you, first of all, keep making sure that you're around people that kick your butt. Yeah. And then now you're, you're the, you're the older guy that kicks the young guys, butt, and like, yeah. you have to be cool about it and you know, Yep. show them how to how to be better and motivate them so that they can come kick your ass next time and it makes you realize hey maybe sometimes some of the older guys who weren't as nice to you maybe they just didn't realize they were the older guys yet because we've all been through that you know <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh man all right so so then what happens you, you graduate from berkeley and you're out in the world what what what's the next move 
Well, I moved to New York the day after I graduated. By oh. that time, I'd been in Boston for four years. I was ready to be out of Boston. It felt like a small town. Actually, you know, there was a, a friend of mine who taught at Berkeley who was a piano player. And we would get together every week and do sessions and stuff. And, you know, one week towards the end of my time there, he, uh, he was like, so are, are you moving to New York? And at that time, I was like, no, I'm going to stay in Boston and just, you know, I want to practice. I want to be ready to move to New York. And he was like, no, I'm not letting you do that. And I was like, what are you talking about? That's what I'm doing. He's like, there's no way you're doing that. I'm going to hound you and make sure that you do not waste your time like that. And his vibe was like, what do you think? Like, you're going to practice for a year or 10 years or 20 years, and you're going to go to New York and floor everybody? That's not how it works. Yeah. Like, you're going to show up. You're going to get your butt kicked, and it's going to be great for you. Um, and I took him up on it. You know, like, I thought about it. And I said, you know, what am I going to do just sitting in a room practicing for years? Like, let me move to New York and sit in my room in New York practicing for years. <laughs> and uh, I did, and it was great. Um, I started working pretty much right away, which was really a, a lucky break. It doesn't happen that way for everybody. Um, I was really fortunate to just get hooked up with good people and kind of start playing locally and touring pretty fast, um, making a living much faster than I ever expected to. Wow. So um, I got really lucky. And what was your first touring gig? Um, I'm trying to think of the very, very first. I'm blanking. I remember like certain early tours. I remember like going to Serbia with um, this band that was Marko Djordjevic on drums, Aaron Goldberg on piano, Matt Pavolka on bass. So like much older, much more established jazz dudes and me. And we were like on tour in Europe and I was probably 22 and I was like, this is so cool. Right. You know? Um, so there were a lot of like early tours like that that I remember and like and those guys really looked out for it. I remember going to the like Aaron's house to rehearse the first time and like he opened the door and he's like, what is this kid doing here? But then we started playing and he was like, oh, cool. Like we can be buddies now. <laughs> it was cool. It was cool for a young kid. You know, I think that there wasn't so much any sort of stigma about being young, but they just want to see that you cared about the music, you know, and that you were like, could treat it like a professional and, you know, be cool to hang with and not be a kid, you know? So, um, so I had a lot of fun on those early tours, like hanging out with, with older cats and, you know, picking their brains about stuff. Yeah. yeah. And man, the, the, the mindset for like moving to New York is such an interesting thing. Like as a kid, you know, I, I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do as a musician and how I'm going to, you know, make a living, but also what I want to be. And so at first it's always, oh, I'm going to be an artist. I'm doing my thing. Right. And then as I get older and I need to, you know, kind of pivot and try to make a living, what well, was like, do I move to New York or Nashville or L.A.? And for me, L.A. seemed like the right move because I thought I could do sessions and sideman stuff. And I wasn't a jazzer, you know, and it seemed like more tours were kind of coming out of L.A. that I could maybe pop on to. But so many of my friends moved to New York with the specific intent of being a straight ahead player. You know, like I'm going to go spend my years being in New York playing straight ahead and it might not end up what I do making to make a living, but I'm going to have that sabbatical basically of this is, you know, that moment. Was that, that really important to you? Well, you know, like I'm thinking back on it and like, that was all I knew. Like I didn't have, I didn't grow up playing gigs. I had those, you know, I had those early gigs that I told you about. And then I kind of went to college yeah. and like, and from the jump in college, they were like, you are a jazz guy now. And I fell in love with it and I took it, you know, so seriously. But at that point, that's really all I knew. And, you know, Berkeley had pop music stuff too. And I did all of it. I did everything I could. But it just seemed like, you know, you graduate and you move to New York. That's what everyone was doing at the time. Right. I remember I knew a few guys that were moving to L.A. And I was like, what are you doing? You know, because that wasn't where people were. That wasn't where most of my peers were going. Uh -huh. Now, first of all, L.A.'s changed so much. But also, I didn't know anything back then, you know. So, like, it just didn't occur to me that, like, to me, it was like, you're going to go to L.A. to play jazz? You know, I didn't get that there was, like, other things that you could do. Right. right. Uh, I was a kid, you know? And um, and I got I got here and, and, you know, played mostly jazz for, for a number of years. And then I found, I discovered all the awesome stuff that New York has, all the great songwriters, all the great, you know, tours that come out of here. And I was like, oh, well, this is just the place for everything. So I want to do it yeah. all here. Yeah, well, there. I mean, I had a lot of friends 
growing up who were more blues based players and then they get into fusion and jazz and the next thing i know they would move to new york and then you know automatically somehow it's like they get just get handed a 175 or something and overnight they don't they don't know anything about pedals they have a polytone and they're just a, this, this new musician you know and uh, you know and it's funny like jonathan kreisberg i used to play gigs with him often in south florida he was in a in a heavy metal band right and then he had a trio that played fusion they would play beatles tunes they would play but he played a strat with tube screamer you know and then i remember him telling me i'm moving to new york you know i'm, I'm gonna try to be more get more into the jazz thing and then yeah two years later i see him with the, the 175 and you know that's it it just changed like that and so many guys i know went through that same thing it's really interesting because i think you might be like me in this way too like i mean we have a lot in common but like i don't know if i had so many phases like that like yeah. this is the guitar that i got when i was 13 it's a 95 tex-mex strat right. i've been playing it the whole time i've kind of like more or less kept the gear the same and like whatever approach i've taken has kind of stayed the same like i didn't really change musical styles i kind of just tried to fit my own thing into you know whatever style i was learning about yeah yeah no we're definitely like-minded in that way you know it was like i was just in, in concerned with kind of following what I liked and trying to really, I mean, from a young age, trying to find what I thought was my voice on the instrument. That was really important to me. Uh, coming out of the Stevie Ray obsession era of my playing, it was like, okay, after that, I have to find what makes me me because, you know, I was on this misguided, you know, <laughs> a quest to be, oh, I, I want to be like him. I want to be a legend. I want to be on Guitar Player magazine covers and sell a bunch of records and be a guitar hero, you know? And so to me, that meant you got to find your shit, you know? So I was, I was really dedicated to like going whatever way I could that was the most me, you know? Yeah. I think that like, I, I didn't have that. Like I wasn't like, I got to find the me, but I was stubborn enough that like, I ended up just doing it anyway by default because I was like, oh, I, don't, I don't like that, I don't like that, I, I want to do this thing, and like, I didn't. Re it didn't even really occur to me that it was me until people started saying, "You really have your own sound, or you you sound really unique." And I was like, "I do," and then I just kind of realized that I was just playing the way that I like to play, and that it wasn't like a quest I was on. It just kind of ended up happening that way. Well, that's which, cool. I, mean, I don't know. If that's good or bad. No, it is good. I mean, because <laughs> it's completely honest. It's organic. I mean, it just it's it's real that's what you are i mean and that's what i was going to ask you next like so when do you start writing tunes and kind of finding your voice as an artist i think it just it again happened along the way and with like a little bit of push from people like i remember one of my first like cool jazz gigs was playing with greg osby who was you know this amazing jazz improviser and you know he started a record label um you know, and he put out his own album on, on that label. At that time, it was a big deal to start your own label, or it seemed like it. Yeah. You know, Greg Hopkins started a label. It was like news. Um, now everyone has their own label. But at the time, it seemed really cool. And he said, hey, do you want to put out an album on the label? And I was like, well, I don't have a band or any music. I was probably 24. But I was like, I should start getting this together. And around the same time, um, someone who's still a great friend of mine, Rio, at the over at the Jazz Gallery here in New York, he said, do you want a gig? And I was like, sure. I took the gig and I was like, gotta get a band and some music together now. So um, I did, I was playing a lot with my friend Mark Giuliano and I was like, I knew I wanted him in the band and I kind of like thought of some other people I'd want to play with. So I kind of put the band together first and then just started writing. Yeah. It just kind of forced you along, you know? I need that, man. I mean, like, you know, I'm feeling it in quarantine because there's not, um, there's not as many things going on. And, and, and the more I can like, set up stuff to like even like when we talked about this thing you're like yeah i'm gonna do this thing i was like give me a date give me a date and a time yeah. you know just yeah. so i can like put it in the books and uh and make sure that i hold myself accountable to it um yeah i've been doing this uh, this record with my friends jeff babco and will lee and keith carlock and jeff coffin and just like i guess you can find record. any good musicians then i mean you, you... i couldn't find any good guys so i had to get those guys um, no, they're the best of the best, and it's and it's it's been awesome because like you know having to record Will Lee tunes at home, like I don't send him a track back until it's perfect, right. you know, because that's his standard, yeah. that's his like bar, you know. So he's played on how many record dates? Like six thousand? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. 
Um, so like, I'm, it, it's great. It's just so awesome for me to like have something to, you know, like you said, like, you know, those guys are the best of the best and like having people like that to play with and, and drag, drag me along is like, I just, I just, I, it helps me so much. I, yeah, I hear you, man. I hear you. And, you know, it all just comes down to this is the, you know, there's a reason we do this. And it's it's just because we love it so much. I mean, we really have no other choice. You know, this is this is all there is. I would be a miserable human being if this was taken away from me. There's no two ways around it. Did you ever have a moment where, like, you thought it might be? I mean, you've been doing it since you were a lot younger. You know, it's like. Yeah. Even even though it's not that much of a difference, right? But like you know, it's it's just maybe in the DNA just a little more. But like, was there ever a point when you're like, man, if I could just find a way out, it would be a relief. Never, no, not even not even close. Like, so I've been playing. I'm 40. I've been playing 35 years almost. You know, and I've been playing professionally since I was 12 years old. So you're talking that's you know 28 years of gigging. You know what I mean? It's a lot yeah. of gigs. And never sure. have I even questioned anything. And that's what's made this pandemic difficult because, you know, yeah, I'm working. I'm playing every day. Um, I'm producing records. I'm mixing. I'm doing sessions. I, I'm now I'm working on the YouTube channel. I got stuff going on. But you and I are both, we're improvisers. Like if you had to say, what do we do? We play guitar. Yeah, but we improvise. And that's been taken away. It's like it's one thing to improvise sitting in here by myself, but that's in a vacuum. And man, it's like you can't I can't overstate how much I miss the interaction with other musicians because it's like 90 percent of what what I ad identify myself as has been taken away from me. So I'm having to get all my enjoyment out of the 10 percent. Hmm. Yeah, I've been, I've been doing some gigs. I've been able to do some like outdoor gigs and live streams with full band here in New York. It's happening a little bit. So, you know, there's some of that. But. Yeah, just like, I, I don't, maybe this will help someone out there. Like, I remember I was in Boston, I was studying with Mick Goodrick at the time. And like, he gave me some crazy chordal thing to learn. And, you know, being a dumb kid, like I, I just tried to do it without warming up. And I really just hurt my hand. And I couldn't play for about a week and a half after that. You know, and I went into the lesson, I said, listen, Mick, like, I can't play anything. I tried to learn how to play, but I kind of messed up my hand. He was like, you know, gotta warm up. Um, and he's like, you need to, you know why, right? Like, you know, can you imagine if you were like hurt your hand so bad and like, you know, you weren't able to do this anymore? And I think that like, I don't know, I was just, I was so scared about whatever was next. I was like, well, yeah, but it would also be kind of a relief, you know, not to never be able to play again, but to not have to have to like put myself out there, not to have to do it as a career. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? It seemed, it seemed like, like I was like, this is my last chance because if if I if I keep going, like I'm in it for life, yeah. and that was scary. Yeah, it is scary, but you know, again, it's like what what else? You got no? I got no other options, and I don't want them. That's partially why we succeed too, is because we take away the, the other options. We force ourselves to do this. Yeah, we're so lucky, though. Yeah. Well, it's it's just the great. <laughs> we're so lucky that we get to. There's yeah. there's nothing as rewarding as you know just playing music. I mean, it really is. It's it's amazing. All right, let's uh let's get into our ten questions. Oh okay, wait, cool. Wait, before the ten questions, just give everybody the the hot licks, Arlen Roth. I need I need an anecdote about your your time oh, there. I, I didn't know. Even, yes, I totally that that we left that out on the um like the trajectory to college, right? Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm a kid. Frank DeBretti has moved to Nashville. I'm teacherless. I got the magazines and that's it. And then like right at the very end, my senior year of high school, I meet Arlen Roth. Um, and Arlen was like, I can't tell you how great he was to me, right? Like I would go to his house for a lesson and we jam for four hours. Right. You know, he was just so stoked to play. And he's like, have you seen this? Have you checked this out? And uh, at one point, you know, Hotlix was still booming. Hotlix, the video instructional company, if you guys don't know what that is. Um, it was like the first, basically the first instructional video company. You know, he would, he would film these great players talking about their thing, put it on a, a VHS, and then people would, around the world would buy them. Um, 
so he said, you know what, you know, if you want to come by the office, I can pay you like, you know, 15 bucks an hour to, to it, it, whatever it was, but it was like really high for, you know, an 18 year old kid, like, yeah. you know, after school job. Um, he was so generous and, um, I would just mail out the videos, you know, and then he, you know, he'd let me take some home and then, you know, he'd be like, Hey man, I didn't finish transcribing that Jimmy Thackeray thing. Do you want to do it, you know, for the booklet? And I was like, yeah. So it was so rad, you know, getting to hang with him and learn from him. And, you know, he was just so giving of his time and just such a sweet, great human being um, that I was really lucky to have in my life. Dude, it's, it's so cool. Like for an after school job, to be something that's all about your passion like that and, and, and to feed into it. I mean, it's even stoked the fire more, you know, number one, you're watching these videos all day long and, and transcribing other players. It's like, you couldn't have asked for something to even motivate you further. And then we'd go to these, he'd be like, Hey, we're going to the long, long Island guitar show on Friday. Like, you know, bring these videos and we'd hang out and sell videos and George Benson would stop by and say hi to Arlen and like, and all these, you know, also all these great players that are like Scotty Anderson guys that like, you know, people, I'm sure you know, but like, you know, they're not um, household names, but like I would hear about them and sometimes get to meet them yeah. through, through Ireland. It was just awesome. Yeah, Too that's cool. crazy. And also just side note, it's crazy to me that you transcribed the Jimmy Thackeray one because Jimmy was like really important in my life as a friend and mentor coming up as a kid. He was always so kind to me and I was a huge fan. Huge fan of Jimmy Thackeray. Did you have the Hot Licks video? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But I had already known Jimmy so, for a while before that video came out. But of course, I bought it the second came out. Yeah. Well, if you looked at that transcription 20 years ago or t more, 22 years ago, yeah. that was like our first time meeting. Yeah, you know, there you go. my transcription made its way into your hands. So <laughs> <laughs> I hope I transcribed it right. Yeah, you must have because, uh, you know, I don't remember. <laughs> I wouldn't have known better anyways, but yeah. <laughs> All right. Ten questions, man. When you first started learning and playing, was there a lick or a song or an idea that when you learned it, it was like set the hook, like, oh, my God, I can't believe I just figured this out. That's it. I'm done. Like, this is, this is the greatest thing ever. I, I don't think there'll ever be anything cooler than this. I've peaked. Um you know, I have a buddy named Chris Kyle. I love telling this story. Chris was like my best friend in high school and also like my first guitar nemesis, right? He was like the guy that, if, if, if you went to our high school and said, who's the best guitar player in high school? No one first, no one would ever say anybody but Chris Kyle. Um, he was like, he was like, you know, he looked like a cool musician from a mile away and he loved Hendrix and he knew all the Hendrix tunes. Um, so of course I wanted to be just like Chris. And, um, you know, I said, Chris, what's, I, not, I wanted to be just like Chris, but I also wanted to be like even better than Chris. Of that course. was like my secret. Yeah. I was like, I want to be a guitar player. Um, so I was like, Chris, what's the hardest song you can play? And he said, Little Wing. So I had uh, Frank DeBretti show me how to play Little Wing and I like worked so hard on it and I got it together. And, um, you know, I started kind of bragging to people. I was like, I can play Little Wing. You know, I don't know if Chris can play Little Wing, but I can play Little Wing. And so he called me one day. He's like, I heard you said you're better than me. Ah. I was like, no, I just said I can play Little Wing. He's like, guitar battle, my house. Oh. And, uh, and I went over to his house and we started playing. We hadn't been friends up to that point. We started playing and then we played a tune. And then he was like, cool, you want to play another one? And we kind of became like best friends after that and you know and he's still, still out there doing it he plays with a great artist named cautious clay he's like just one of the guys that like you know never stopped doing it is yeah. still out there crushing it but learning to play little wing was like a huge moment because i think i realized like maybe i could be the guitar player guy yeah. you know that's awesome man yeah I, I i remember learning little wing and feeling very proud like man this is just yeah. So amazing yeah. yeah i still you know it's still challenging Oh, dude, the first time I played a BB King intro to Slow Blues, that was it. From I was probably seven or something. It was like, you know, when when that when this came out, you know, and and I heard it come out of my amp and my hands like, it was like, oh, nothing will ever be better than this feeling that I just got right now. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. 
Absolutely. All right. Badass. What, what was the first solo you ever learned note for note? Was it Little Wing then? <laughs> Man, you know, I, I remember the first solo that I remember really like practicing night and day, and I couldn't play it now except for one lick, was Rock and Roll, Jimmy Page on okay. Rock and Roll. And I remember like the, I don't remember where it starts, but that thing where he's like... <laughs> Whatever it was, like yeah. I was, I was, I was ready to go on that one. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good. So, were you a big Zep fan? Yes, still am. Yeah, and so what? I didn't ask you this earlier, but what do your parents listen to? What kind of music were they into? Man, my parents are not like super musically inclined, like, and they'll be the first to admit it. They listen to a lot of classical music, if anything. And my dad would listen to like the most horrible pop stuff from not from time to time. Wow. Like um. Like we're going to Ibiza. Like he would love like a good like dancey like total um, sugar coated pop hit. Wow. Um, but other than that, they 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 did play a lot of classical music. That was like their chill evening music. You know. Interesting. They didn't so you have were the on record collection. Man. I was totally on my own, man. Like I could raid my parents' record collection, but I wouldn't find much. Um, Crazy. So yeah, I was definitely like searching it all out um, through friends and you know wherever i could find it yeah. oh cool man all right rock and roll um what's the first thing you play when you pick up a guitar do your hands just go somewhere mine do and then like if you're in a store and you're trying a guitar or something and you or someone hands you a guitar do you have something you play to like even just see if you dig this guitar like is there is there somewhere your hands just go it's really funny man because yes of course right. like i don't know if everybody has that but always play in this kind of style I'll use I'll usually play some like kind of bluesy ish even though you know in my regular gigging life I don't always play like that right. but that's the first thing it's usually in G and it's usually something and if, if it's not in G It'll be an E. So yeah. G or E, usually G. Yeah. See, same for me. It was. It used to be E, and it was the same thing every time. And it's so much so that I'd be on tour as a side man, and I'd flip my standby switch, and before I could play it, other musicians would play it to me because I'd done it on every gig and every time I first pick up the guitar. You know, it was like something like. I, Literally, I could call up a bass player or somebody, and he would sing it to me over the phone right now. But it was something like, I mean, whatever. That was like my turn on the amp lick. And so now it's in G. I, I modulate it to like. You know, just something to get from one to four. But it went from E to G somewhere over the years. <laughs> That's great. I want to learn that. <laughs> Sometimes I just, that, that's my turn on the amp thing, what I showed you, or just check out a guitar. But like, usually when I pick up my guitar, it's not one thing. I'll just kind of. partially warm up yeah. Yeah. yeah well that leads to the next question what do you hear in your head like as a running narration uh, you know i'm hearing a shuffle all the time and i'm hearing it's like charlie parker is in my head all i can hear is it's 24 hours a day and when i lay down to go to bed i have to like let it finish almost and come to a resolve before I can go to sleep, because this improv just never goes away. Do you have something like that that just runs all the time? I don't, bro. I think you need to see someone. Ah. No, I'm kidding. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't. Like when when I when I pick up the instrument, or if I'm thinking about music, I can focus in. But when I'm away from it, I I don't think it's there. Okay. And maybe it should be. I don't know. Maybe it would it would be calming to like kind of just have that going on all the time. 
but I, mean, I don't. It's, it's really weird. Like I, I will so often be in the car and hear something, you know, and it's always a shuffle, but I'll hear a rhythmic grouping of notes that I wouldn't have played. Like maybe I'll be going da-da, da-da, better do better do that, better do that, better do that, better da-da. And it'll be like, wait a minute, I've never played that before. And, and it'll, it'll register. And then next time I pick up a guitar, it may come out. You know what I mean? But yeah. It, yeah. it never stops. It's like I have just a narration that goes all the time. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And it's in B flat. It's always in B flat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. All right. When, when did you feel like you started to find, you know, uh, we talked about this a little earlier, but when did you feel like you started to find your voice? Was there a moment in your, you know, in a technique or in a style when you were on a gig and this solo came out and you felt like, shit, that does sound kind of like me, you know, or someone pointed it out to you, like you said, and did you and did you make a conscious decision to kind of go further maybe down that path? Man, it's an interesting story because like uh, I remember one moment in again in college uh, walking hanging out with the great guitar player Adam Agati. You uh -huh. familiar yeah. with Adam? Yeah, I know Adam. Yeah, total badass. Plays with uh, Marcus Miller, Ludacris, yep. yeah. uh, Corey Henry now. Yep. Um, but we were walking, we were talking about what we were working on. Adam was like, man, you know, I just want, I'm just looking for my own sound, which is, you know, a totally normal thing to say. Yeah. But at the time, I hadn't really thought about it that much for myself. And I was kind of like, oh, that's cool. I'm not there yet. Like, I'm just I'm just playing. But at the same time, I think I already had my own sound. And I, I just wasn't thinking of it like that. It wasn't like something that I was like, I just kind of liked what I, I, I played the way I liked. The, the, I played the way I wanted to play. I played the way I wanted to sound. I never tried to sound like anybody else with the exception of there was a period where I tried to sound like Stevie. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then it just, you know, it it faded, you know, and I started getting to these other things and I started checking out other styles of music. But Stevie was always there. But that's kind of the only person I've ever, ever tried to sound like. Yeah. Um, and of course, I couldn't um, even come close. So I. I probably gave up on it fast, but I remember that like, you know, going on into college, like, I remember one guy was like, hey man, do you like John Schofield? And I was like, sure, I love John Schofield. And he's like, yeah, I can tell. And I was like, fuck you, man. What a jerky thing to say. Like, you know, and I was like, of course I love Sco. I still love Sco, but I don't think there was... I think even then I knew that I was like, there's not much truth to what he said. Like, right. you know, he's an influence undoubtedly, but I don't think I ever sounded like him in a direct kind of way. Yeah. Um, and I think I was like fairly confident about that. I was like, I know what I sound like actually. So maybe that was kind of a moment, even though he was like kind of like saying, Hey, you don't sound like yourself in my heart. I was like, well, actually I do. Yeah. And it wasn't much longer after that than all of a sudden, like everyone kept telling me how much I sounded like myself. And I was like, oh, I didn't know, but I guess, I guess I do, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and I still get that a lot, which is like awesome. I'm really, I'm really, I'm really grateful people hear it like that. Cause it doesn't yeah. always happen. There's like certain guitar players I know that sound very much like themselves and like people always compare them to other players and, yeah. you know, I'm not on that bandwagon. I'm like, they don't actually, they sound just like themselves, but yeah. You know, maybe your frame of reference is that you know you want them to sound like somebody else. That's, that's exactly it. People can't understand something unless they have something they can relate it to that they do understand. You know, and that's that's you know that's a problem for sure. But dude, you definitely have your own voice, and I'm going to put you on the spot later and make you play cool. something that is uniquely yours. <laughs> All right, uh, dude. Number six. What's your biggest weakness on the guitar? Mine is trying to be James Taylor, like intricate acoustic guitar. It's it's kryptonite to me. What's yours? Jeez, I have so many. Where where do I even start? Honestly, my biggest weakness I think is like sometimes I'm just I'm like so idea curious. You know, I feel like I could just take a line and just keep going with it and like never shut up. <laughs> and I listen back and I'm like you know, I miss all these exit ramps. I'm like, oh, I could have just stopped there. I could have just stopped there and it would have been great, but I didn't, I kept going and it's like, it lost the, the story was gone. It's not a technical thing, but it's it's like, I don't know, I've, I've you know, I've, I'm so excited about exploring 
sometimes I, I'm like a little bit like lost in the woods and I need someone to be like, Hey, come it's dinner time. Come home. You know, like, yeah. So that's something that I'm trying to work on. And especially now that I have the time to really focus on my, like, it's almost something I'm like embarrassed to say, you know, it's like a vulnerable thing to just talk about it, but I need to get it out there because I need to, I want to fix it. And I've been wanting to fix it for years. It just hasn't happened yet. It's weird. Like, you know, you're self editing yourself when you're improvising and you, you're trying to be in the moment a hundred percent. So that means playing honestly and, and playing what you're hearing and feeling, but then you can look back objectively and be like, maybe this story would have been a little bit better if I wrapped up that idea. I, I, I hung on that thing or, or maybe I should have turned left here when I, you know, so you have to find this balance between, you know, did I really tell my story or was I just completely free forming it here? You know, and it's weird finding that balance because you want to be open, but you also want to tell a c concise story. Yeah, and I think sometimes when you start editing editing yourself in real time, it's like you you like you're almost like a little shaken. You're like, oh wait, but what was I saying? It's like you know because you interrupted yourself. Yeah. Um, so just finding that right thing where like you you learn to like you know relax into it and not and not have it feel like an interruption, but just have it feel like you know a different way of telling your story. So that's yeah. something that I've I need to work on. Yeah, it's definitely it's like an instinctual thing of knowing that you know you're making the right choices as you're making the right choices which is difficult trusting trusting yourself yeah yeah absolutely yeah and i think that's why i go i'll go on too long sometimes because it's like a lack of trust or something it's mm. like it's like i better keep playing so that so that i'm good or something i don't know what it is it's some, it's some mental stuff you know that's kind of the hardest thing about music when you get to a level where you're like technically fluid and like yeah. you know this thing is although it's always a battle you know, sometimes it's like, you know, you need to do the work away from the instrument. Dude, there's a weird, still about music. But. There's a weird spot when you get to a proficiency level on, in anything where it becomes less about how much you can do. Because it, it's like when the barriers get taken away, you yeah, you can, like, do too much. It's weird. Uh, you know that feeling when you're on the road and you get to, like, sixth gig in a row and you could do no wrong? Like the second you think of something, it comes out in your fingers. Yeah. I, I love and I live for those moments. But at the same time, then on the eighth gig, I'll find, Jesus Christ, I'm not shutting up. Like I'm just, it's because I can pull off anything right now. I am pulling off anything right now. And it's not the most musical, you know? Yeah. Like you're chasing that feeling from that sixth night. Yeah. That feeling of like just flowing out, Yeah. you know, and now it's like. It's not really, I, I don't know if that eighth night feeling is really flowing. It's like, it's like, it's almost the, the your, 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 your physical self is like tuned up, but like you're, you're not in the moment the way you were on that special night. Exactly. Yeah. The physical part could be totally in tune and it'll, it'll sometimes lead you the wrong way. You know what I mean? Like baseball players swinging yeah. for the fences all the time. Well, that's not necessary yeah. in all occasions, you know? Yeah. Interesting. I think right. you'd be a good baseball coach, Josh. I think <laughs> I think you can be a Hall of Famer. Maybe, believe in you, man. maybe, maybe in the future. All right. Um, who's a huge influence on your guitar playing that maybe would be a shock to people to hear? Jimmy Herring. Oh, okay. All right. Are you shocked? No, I'm not shocked. I'm not shocked. <laughs> uh, Jimmy was the first guy. He was like kind of the bridge between. Um, you know, between Stevie Ray and like learning jazz for me, uh -huh. he was like a guy when I heard him, I was like, what is he doing? Like, I didn't understand what he was doing. And I, I tried to like everything I could find of his, I, I tried to get, and I tried to learn it. You know, I was just so such a fan. I still am. Yeah. Um, but like, he was just a real bridge. Cause he, he really knew how to play rock and, and blues bass guitar yeah. in like a real way. But he also knew how to go beyond that in a way that didn't sound contrived. It sounded musical. Yep. It was like it was real so it was something that i could understand and appreciate and i just appreciated the realness of it all it's amazing know? how important that is to find a guy who can do the stuff you already like convincingly and with respect but then open up some other doors for you and it was that way for me with robin ford you know at first yeah. i didn't dig robin that much because he wasn't aggressive enough and didn't bend strings like like you know he didn't sound like alver king or stevie ray he wasn't bending all over but then I heard him play like in a in a blues context on his older stuff with Jimmy Witherspoon and with Charlie Musselwhite, 
and it became clear to me, oh, no, 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 no. This guy loves the blues and respects the blues and knows his history, and maybe it is okay to play this other stuff that I'm hearing already. It's not like I'm trading on the blues. I'm not turning my back on it. You can do this at the same time and still love real blues, and that was important for me. Yeah, I mean, I'm a Robin fan too, yeah. no question. Yeah. All right, dude, would you rather have a great guitar and a shitty amp or vice versa? Would you rather have a, a great amp and a, and a crappy guitar? A great amp and a crappy guitar. What's that? In a gig situation. Crappy guitar, great amp. I'm with you 100%. Yeah. But it's been split yeah. down the middle, the answers. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I have a really hard time with, with I, I don't really care that much about the playability. I mean, this thing's not entirely playable already, but like, you know, I can make something come out, you yep. know, even if the guitar is not, you know, great, you know, but a bad amp sound just is like kryptonite. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about it gives me the, the creeps, you know, it's like, it's just so important to have it sound good. And I feel like you know the guitar can only do so much yeah i'm I'm with you 100 percent. the audience will get a way better performance from me with a good amp and, and a, any guitar than they will get with any my guitar. main guitar and a crate or a pv solid state amp 100 percent. i've gotten better at making those work like i used to just be like oh i can't just can't do it yeah. and now i'm like i can kind of get i can kind of go you know with whatever you throw at me um more and more and more um, so maybe that'll change over the years. Like sometimes it's really fun to like, be like, wow, this, this PV tone is really crushing right now or whatever. It, <laughs> you know, it's funny. You, you, we're both friends with Oz Noy, right? And like oh, yeah. Yeah. Oz, has been, Oz has been doing these like weekly um, outdoor, like kind of just hang jam session things yeah. here in New York, just as a chance to get to play. And so I came down the other week and he brought a, a battery powered amp for me. And we're both playing out of these battery powered amps and like, you know, the tone is not exactly righteous, but it's passable, yeah. you know, and, and uh, it was just a fun, like, you know, we used to geek out about two rocks and now we're like <laughs> trading notes on battery powered amps, you know? Yeah. Right. So yeah. Yeah. I just interviewed him the other day and he was telling me about the battery amps, <laughs> the battery amps. Yeah. He's like the connoisseur, right? Like, yep. Yep. You yep. Know? <laughs> oh, man. All right. What keeps you so motivated, man, to, to just keep getting better? Because we all know those guys who we grew up listening to, and they're the age uh, then that we are now. And now if we look at where they're at, maybe they haven't grown as a player. But what keeps you growing and pushing forward? Well, I hope I am. You know, like sometimes I don't feel like I am, but then I, I, I check in and I'm like, oh, actually I have gotten – a lot a lot better it's you know first of all it's the people that that push me but also it's i just cannot stand the feeling of not moving forward it, it feels so lousy uh, to me you know i really need that that feeling of momentum you know and if i don't have it, it i'm i'm literally unhappy um very much so so like i just have i just have to i have to or else i'm not i'm not going to be content with with the music aspect of my life which is for all of us such a big part of our lives so i just know i need it it's like you know some people know that they need to get a workout in the morning i know that i need to i don't practice hardly enough but i know that i if i don't feel like i'm moving forward i'm not happy and um so i always you know i need that yeah i'm with you man it, it drives me crazy if i hear a recording of myself from you know a month ago or two months ago and I don't feel like I've learned some new stuff since then. I, mean, I haven't pushed my – that makes me angry, actually, and it, it makes me work harder because, uh, yeah, it's it's been that way since I was a kid. It's like if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. At least that's how it feels to me. doesn't mean you ever sound bad. I could probably find a tape of you playing at age 12 and be like, damn, I'm going to transcribe that, or, you know, like, right. how killing is that? Right. No, it's, it's not that I hate what I was playing. It's more I want right. to hear I want to hear progression. I want to hear, yeah, you know, because I know I'm putting in the time. I want to hear the results, you know. Yeah, you want to feel it. You want to feel like you're a different person than you were. Yep. You know, that you're not just carrying this old stuff with you into the future day by day by day. You're actually changing and, you know, letting time do the good things that it does. Yeah. All right. And number 10, man, in five years, 
What do you see? Do you want to be more doing your solo stuff? Do you just want to keep on keeping on, being, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that? Uh, what, where do you see yourself, you know, down the line? Is, is there a goal or something special, or is it just to keep on keeping on? No, I, w I want to be doing them both at a much higher level, you know, or consistently very, I mean, I love what I do. I'm so lucky to get to do it, but I would love to be doing, you know, all the pop stuff that I do at, you know, the highest level. Yeah. And I would love to be doing, have my career going at the highest level. I, I would like to just be better. That's the first thing, right? Just, I, I th this is kind of maybe naive or sappy, but I, I do feel like if, if you're good enough and you're a functional human being, like, on top of it, all, all the things you want will come to you, right? Yeah. So like, you know, maybe I'm not ready for certain things, but hopefully I'll get there. I'd like to be, you know, like, you know, I've heard be Hancock calls or whoever calls or Sting calls, like the, the odds that they will call are much, much higher if you're ready for them to call. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd like to be more ready. And, um, although I do, I hope they call when we get off. Yeah. Oh wait, hold on a second. Herbie's calling right Hello? now. Um, no, I, I just, I just want to be better at this thing that we do, that we love yeah. and I, you know, I want to keep doing it. And, and I think that all the other things that I want will come as I get better. I hope. Yeah. And, and they will because, because you put in the time, you love it. They will. It, it's coming, you know? Yeah. Put, I put in the time first. Yeah. Oh, dude. Well, thank you, dude. And members, uh, for members, we're going to have our little turn two section coming up after this. So if you're not a member, hit join right here because you're missing out on a lot of great content. But anyways, dude, it's been a pleasure. And, uh, dude, I'm just so glad, glad that we've connected and become friends. I really, truly admire your playing, and, and I just like talking. Likewise, dude. Likewise, man. This was so fun. Thanks for having me on. And, and uh, yeah, bro. More, more real life hangs to come soon, hopefully. Absolutely, real life guitar and Mexican food coming soon. Absolutely. All right.